Hello everyone, welcome to the SuperCloud 6. I'm John Furrier here in the Palo Alto Studio with Dave Vellante and our entire CUBE team presenting our sixth episode of SuperCloud. The topic is AI innovators. We're featuring the hottest founders and startups as well as leading enterprises who are setting the agenda for the next generation infrastructure, software, and applications around generative AI and the future of software. Dave, it's great to see you. Thanks for coming, flying out and uh, doing an in-person. Again, great lineup. This AI innovators theme is resonating because yeah. who's not an innovator? No one wants to be not well, an innovator. Of course, I mean, it's always, John, first of all, good to be back in Palo Alto, but this AI thing is real. It's AI everywhere, it's happening. I mean, we're talking about it's powering all the trends, all the markets, and you know, it starts at the bottom of the stack, right? We talked about this yeah. in Barcelona on our Cube Pod with companies like NVIDIA and Broadcom and other semiconductor players, but it's really all the way through that stack. It's a, it's a, it's a ortho orthogonal slice through it. You know, this is our 14th year doing theCUBE and our team, you know, we are, it's like you get caught up in the wave, right? We are on a growth curve that we've never seen, where we've been chronicalizing the, the evolution of big data going back to 2010 during the Hadoop days, cloud scale comes in and I, we're like in the middle of this, of the storm here. And then all of a sudden the huge growth waves coming in called generative AI. We were seeing, we were talking about next generation cloud just about a year and a half ago when we started talking about super cloud. But what it's morphed into is really super chips, super applications, super infrastructure. And the thing that's going on now with generative AI is that everybody has realized that this is a new game. The game is still the same, but it's, it's being played out under new conditions, new infrastructure, new software abstractions, new kinds of chips and server and component configurations like we covered with Broadcom and others and like NVIDIA. But the developer action is super robust. Linux Foundation with KubeCon, CNCF, you got massive open source development. So all this is going on like at the same time. So you have this perfect storm of innovation and the founders we're going to feature today and the big companies like Uber who have literally crafted what looks like the next generation AI systems. And I think that's the theme that we're seeing, this whole systems revolution, systems mindset. And if you look at the trends, we're going to get into it, and I want to get, your, get the data for you have is, the developers are moving so fast, and the infrastructure changes need to catch up. And that's where the, the power dynamic. Well, there's so many similarities, we talked about this between this wave and previous waves, specifically the dot-com wave, forgetting the cloud for a second, but back then you had a lot of hype. Of course, you have a lot of hype today. You had a lot of CapEx build out. The CapEx build out back then was a lot of companies that kind of went out of business, you know, companies like Enron or, and the like, and took on a lot of debt. Today, it's the hyperscalers that are building this out. But you know, nonetheless, you, it, it was a situation where it was everywhere, right? AI is everywhere today. The internet is, it was everywhere. The big difference to me, John, is some of the things that you were talking about you really can't have good AI, good AI without good data. So there's not only a transformation going from AI, but there's a data transformation going on where everybody's kind of trying to put data at the core of their business because it's an enabler for quality AI. And then you have this other piece, it, it, it's not as much the Wild West because you have legal and compliance concerns and they're serious and their you know, potential reputational damage is much, much, high, much higher than it was back in, say for instance, the Hadoop days where anybody could do what they want and there was not a lot of governance and then people said, okay, hey, we got to rein this in. Now they're reining it in from the start. One of the observations that's come out over the past few months and just recently is the whole growth of this new market tends to be normally bottom up. Developers show some things, momentum and grows bottom up. But with generative AI, because data is involved, to your point, the crown jewels of the company have to be involved in understanding what generative AI means. What that means is that startups and innovators have to deal with two things. A moving train in terms of the growth trend, a generative AI, the new technology, the new infrastructure, and then dealing with the sensitive data in the company. So it's not like throw an experiment out there, get a dev team going, you got to do both. You got to hit, you got to hit the innovation on the development side and infrastructure and bring the data that's the crown jewels of the company into the fold in the start. That's unique. I haven't seen that move in a long time. I think that's a power dynamic that frankly gives startups a challenge because you got to go in and sell essentially an enterprise sale to get the data. Because without the data, you can't actually show any value at generative AI. They can't just set up a cluster and say, hey, we're set up for generative AI, now what? You yep. got to get the data. And I think that's going to be a, a challenge and an opportunity for whoever can crack the code on that. And I want to, I want to actually, if I may, set up the macro. We have a, we have some data on this from our partners, ETR. This the, the first slide that we wanted to show you was it's kind of AI everywhere. What we were talking about, and what we look at is, 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 is you'll see when we bring that up. There's these sectors that are 
uh, affected by AI, you can see on the vertical axis here, it's just spending, where people are spending, what the momentum is, and the horizontal axis is like the size of the market, think of it that way, but look at ML and AI. It bottomed <clears throat> one month prior to ChatGPT and then escalated, and if, when, if you go back if, in time series, all these other uh, uh, platforms and, and sectors were much higher, AI was kind of waning, and then look what's happened. Everything got kind of pushed down below that red line, which is like the magic line. And so the point is that we're stealing from other budgets, John, <clears throat> okay? And so people are going to have to start showing ROI yeah. or else they're going to get some pressure from the CFOs. It's not like the top line is growing. Yeah, let's leave that slide up there. I want to just comment. If you look at the red line, container orchestration, container platforms, cloud computing, the rest that drops below um, is essentially not impacted negatively by the trend. This points to the data that we have that we were just commenting on that the infrastructure is where the action is right now. Yep. Um, and if you look at what will happen next is if you just connect the dots, container orchestration essentially is cloud native stuff. So just put that into the cloud native bucket. Cloud computing will grow and continue to be, be a power dynamic there. Then as generative AI gets better from a scale standpoint, once people figure it out, everything below that red line will lift up. So you look at robotics, you got marketing, you got servers, telephony. We commented about Cisco in our last QPOT, IP telephony and routing, it's to the bottom. So contact center, all that stuff will rise up. And I think that's where the action is going to happen. I think it's kind of below the line right now because people don't know what to do. They don't have yet visibility on the, on the implementation of the use cases. And I think that's going to be the opportunity. Right, so they're experimenting now, and then once they figure it out, it's going to, yeah. it, that, that has to be the way it plays out. It's going to be injected into all these other sectors, and that's going to be the rising you, tide that lifts all If you all change the label ML slash AI at the top there where it's highlighted, just call that generative AI, that will rise up and that will pull yep. everything up. Thank so you, right on. I think the pull will happen, and again, this is going to be a, the classic rising tide floats all boats, and uh, all good, great, great research. Yeah, so thank you for sharing that. So, okay, <clears throat> and then you, you've also got this other premise that we didn't think back, John, it was just about a little over a year ago we were sitting here to, you know, talking about this, saying, okay, what's, what is this open AI thing? Are they going to be able to maintain their advantage? You said they would be able to. We'll talk about that in a moment, but, but it is accelerated so fast, certainly faster than anything we've ever seen before, and then we put forth this idea of the power law. You know, that's the other piece of it, which is, and we're starting to see evidence that people are beginning to do things on-prem. Well, why do you think that is? Let's, well, let's when we first came up with the power law, if you throw the power law up there, I want to just show that. Yeah, that's that the second slide there. Yeah, put the second slide up there, that power law. So we had saw that the, at the beginning, we had predicted that ChatGPT and OpenAI would set the agenda as a large language model, be the kind of the mainstream, consumer view of how AI generated plays out from a consumer standpoint. Even with all the hallucination flaws, it was clear that that was going to be a monster opportunity. And then what we were seeing in the data was is that as you go down the power law, the size of the model and maybe the size and small scope of it, where the specialty models, where the power law comes in, where the data was strong. So you had high quality data in, these, in the long tail of the power law that would interact with the uh, existing one. That's exactly what played out with the RAG, the, re the retrieval augmentation generation market, which is the hottest thing happening right now. Retrieval is becoming the killer app. And Jensen said on stage last week at Stanford, he sees that same thing, and that these specialty models will be where the inference IP will be. The intellectual property around inference will come in from the specialty models. And, and that's that long tail there with all these industries, right? Yeah. That's what you're talking about here. On Much of that being on-prem, right? Yeah, and so the, what's going to happen is people will have a choice between using a managed service like OpenAI or Anthropic or hosting their own Llama, Mistral, or having their own linguistic or language foundation model. So the hosting will be the challenge, and right now it's more expensive to host then just use a managed service in the, at the short term. So most startups are going to start to experiment with hosting models and what I've been calling clustered systems as the scale gets higher. So you're going to see a huge growth in, in specialized AI models that are going to be, I won't say proprietary in the sense of not open, but they're going to be intellectual property as data from the enterprises or the startups. So the data quality will be the new intellectual property. And I think that's going to be something that you're going to see people license models through API access, you know, metering it, things like that nature. So I think you're going to see a surge in the, in the, and here you have no neck and no, no, no torso in the tail. I think you see a fatten, fattening up of that mid range uh, model there. You see the long tail extend out and go higher, but well, you're going to uh, see the neck increase 
and the and the and the belly or the torso increase that the red line. And, and I want to explain that because that was the huge contribution in addition to other contributions you made to this was that red line pulling up. And you made the point early on, look, open source is really going to pull that torso up and to the right. Like a lot of power laws, that doesn't happen. It's just dominated by a few names. But now we're certainly seeing, I mean, Meta, you know, Meta estimates that maybe half of the Llama 2 deployments could be on-prem. You know, the data that we have suggested, you know, at least 30%, and of course, you know, when you get inside of, you know, three-letter government agencies, it could be much, much higher than that. But the other point that you made that I really want to emphasize is that domain specificity, that model, model specificity, AI is going to go to where the data is, and there's still a ton of data in healthcare mm -hmm. and government and retail and manufacturing that's on-prem. It's never going to necessarily be into the cloud. Not that there's not going to be a ton of activity in the cloud. There is, that's where a lot of it is today. But there's no reason to try to shove all that data back into the cloud, rather bring the AI to the data. And if the tools are there, yeah. that's going to be a very successful model. Well, the thing about that is, is that the cloud, it's all cloud operations. So what the yes. big trend is, is that it's not just cloud, public cloud. It's it's on-premise cloud, it's edge cloud, it's actually cloud operations. That's why we saw container optimization, container orchestration high up on the list with Generative AI, that pull on the other slide. You're going to see that interact. And with the power law, what's going to happen, we believe in the research we're seeing is that you're going to see specialty models in the, the torso and the tail interact with the large language models. And you're going to see an interaction between models. You're going to see models talking to each other and sharing data. You're going to see a model for security and a model for other things. So I think the power law will end up uh, happening. Uh, the, the ironic thing was Jensen actually acknowledged the power law on his Stanford. Oh yeah, uh, uh, everybody NVIDIA is, is like, I mean, it's, it's playing out. Well, that's what the we value were early on in that. Well, because once people see the value of generative AI, they go, I see value because they have the proprietary data. When they have their own data that's in good form, they can see instant benefits. And that's why they're going to see a lot of interaction with the bigger models, because by models working together, they can see instant value and they go, wow, that's transformative. It literally is a step function change and they're going to throw money, more money at it. And the next question is going to be, what's the spend? How do I manage my spend? <laughs> what's it going to cost me? And do I get more value revenue wise out of it or cost reduction? So you're going to start to see questions like, am I saving enough? How much am I saving and how much am I making? And those two things are going to play out and, and you're going to cross connect that with how much did it cost? Well, and that's <clears throat> part of the reason why we've invited Uber in today to really understand how they're using AI, yeah. Walmart as well. These are two big examples of companies that are actually getting ROI out of AI. I think most companies are not, to be quite honest with you. But the other thing I want to bring up, and you and I have talked about this a lot, of course, uh, Elon is in the news again, suing you know, open AI, calling him closed AI, and there's a lot of kerfuffle there. But the quality of these models, while it's, they're increasing very, very rapidly, open AI still has a lead. And I want to bring up the, the third slide, Noah, if you could just to give you a sense as to how big that gap is. This is essentially the vertical axis is, in, is intent to engage. So it's activity and engagement. And the horizontal axis is mind share. And look at in the upper and upper right, I had to put a red you know, bar yeah. around it because they're all, literally off the charts. Look at the gap between it's, it's anthropic and, and cohere and character AI and all the other, you know, many of the open source. And look at that giant gap. I inferred where Llama would be from some other data that, that we have from ETR. But that gap is, is enormous, and, and so people are saying that a lot of people are waiting for um, you know, the next generation of, of NVIDIA chips to train, to get beyond you know, uh, GPT-4, um, the, the H200s. But OpenAI is really you know, doing great right now, and a lot of people are engaging with them. Not that these other models aren't ultimately going to catch up, but, but they've got the lead right now, and they have a lot of the data to, to lean on. What are your thoughts on this gap? Well, I think first of all, they're running away with it mainly because they had they had the lead and they're going to continue to push it. But and Microsoft and, and the Microsoft factor, and they're monetizing quickly. So I think that's going to be a great sign. I think Anthropic's going to do well too. I think Llama and Mistro will rise. I think those will be the big three. Cohere will be in the mix. Jasper, I'm not too sure about, but I think Anthropic, because of the AWS relationship and their other clouds, you're going to see them pull in there. So I think they'll move fast in on OpenAI, but OpenAI will be, you know, can how. How can they extend that lead? And I think that's going to be in this generation of op um, generative AI, the winners need to have the whole, everyone talks about what's the mode, right? What's the mode of the company? Well, the mode speed. So if you look at OpenAI, and we said this last time, the way they're going to win is just continue to keep the distance between them and the number two. So in their rear view mirror, they're going to look at Anthropic and Llama and Mistral. Llama mainly is dangerous because Facebook is going to be probably a powerhouse uh, hoster of scale. And I think Amazon, Google, Microsoft, 
um, and Meta, Facebook, will be infrastructure of choice, maybe even Oracle, we mentioned that last night at dinner. These are going to be the infrastructure that people are going to run on. Uh, and the power that they have um, is going to be to the pr to proportion of like how we think about electricity. And I think that's going to be really interesting conversation because that's going to be where the discussion is. Are they too big? Yeah. And will that stifle innovation? My feeling the power law shows and those, those graphs show that there will be a rising tide. So I think it's not going to be stifle innovation, but it, w it does beg the question, what are they enabling? Well, what, but what do they have a lock-in spec on, on the action? And, and if you look at the CapEx spend, again, this is a big difference between the dot-com bubble and now is the CapEx is, is really being driven by the hyperscalers. In fact, if you look at NVIDIA's last quarter, their quarterly revenue is about half of the CapEx spend in the quarter, which is pretty amazing. Because obviously people are spending a lot, these hyperscalers are spending a lot on GPUs. But having said all that, John, you've got, you, you've got real innovation going on. I mean, Amazon's going for optionality, they're going for tooling, they're going for you know, features, and that's, that, that playbook has worked for them, and they're going to try to eliminate the non-differentiated heavy lifting in AI. You know, Google, well, despite its troubles, is obviously putting a lot of investment in AI. It's got you know, great tech, and then Microsoft did just a brilliant move there. So, and then you have this whole entire other ecosystem saying, hey, we want innovation alternatives to NVIDIA, we want innovation alternatives to OpenAI and Microsoft, so the entire industry is yeah. funding this thing. And, and that's well, where the innovation is going to come well, from. Well, there's a couple of factors. The, the funding, the resources required to do it are going to be constrained and contested. So that's why- You mean you like GPUs? The, well, right. GPUs, but also that's why you see all the clouds taking equity positions in these deals as basically barter for the cost and they're going to trade their resource. Uh, I was talking to a startup we, we're going to have on here, talking about cloud insurance, like flood insurance. What if you can't get your GPUs? We'll, we'll guarantee <laughs> performance. So you're starting to see a whole financial modeling around not just cost optimization, but cost management, cost strategy. So that's going to be the action on the cost side. The guests we have coming in from the startup side, mainly around data, uh, Venkat from Rockset, Kyle from uh, One House. We got NVIDIA, big name coming in, Snowflake. We got Uber, Zscaler. Um, we got uh, Neo, Neo4j on the database side, uh, Single Store, MongoDB Ventures, Y Labs doing kind of like this new, I would call a new observability category that's emerging around AI ops, I won't call it observability, but it's because it's not true observability. And then just a ton of startups doing innovators. This is, this is an innovators market and the innovators will win. And what we're looking for is how are these innovators and their customers applying AI? That's what we're going to hear from Uber and Walmart. Really interesting what Walmart's done with their, their cloud native uh, platform, their super cloud, if you will. They've built an abstraction yep. layer called Element over it. That's where all the AI happens in the yep. ML. Same thing with Uber, how they're evolving their platform. Walmart. <clears throat> yeah, it's going to be really an amazing day yeah. here, John. AI innovators, as we see them, are the folks making it happen. They're the ones who are investing and on the cutting edge, and we're going to ca categorize them all out here and continue this here at SuperCloud 6 and AI innovators. We're going to continue on the 19th. We're going to have an addendum to this program. So uh, stay with us as we kick off SuperCloud 6. We'll be right back after this break. <laughs>